when you get a, a poem like this one, which is all just one big stanza, sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming to come to grips with it initially. So a useful thing to do, first of all, is to just spot where the sentences start and stop. Because it gets you thinking about some of the rough building blocks that go to make up the poem. It's not just a big wall of text that you can't make sense of. So let's get the first one, which is very long, going from when men were all asleep down to drifting and sailing. The next one goes from all night it fell down to thin and spare. Then we've got then boys I heard to white mossed wonder. Then a very short sentence. Oh, look at the trees, they cried. Oh, look at the trees. Just one line. Then we have with lessened load down to stir of the day. And then the final sentence, for now doors open down to broken at the bottom here. Once you've figured out where each sentence starts and stop, the next thing to think about is whether there's any significant variation in sentence length and what clues that might give you about the tone or pace of the poem. So two sentences, both of nine lines, to begin the poem. Then we've got five lines, so getting a bit shorter. Then one line, then we've got from with less and load down to one, two, three, four, five, six lines. And then the final sentence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. So the longest sentences come at the beginning of the poem, two of equal length, nine lines long. And then the shortest sentences tend to come around the middle of the poem. And the very shortest one, just one line long, is in fact the only time anybody speaks in the poem. And it is the children showing their amazement at what the snow has done to transform the normally brown, quite dirty, grim town into a dazzlingly beautiful, as they see it, playground for them. So I'd already be noting, if you want a point about sentence length, the shortest one here stands out very clearly because it's a moment of emotional climax and excitement. So note down that the shortest sentence shows this great moment of excitement. So we thought about why the short one is short, why it's dramatic, what it reveals about the children's state of mind. The question now is, why do we start with two that are so long? The first one is describing the snow falling on the town. And you'll note that there's a lot of detail. The subject of this clause is the snow, but so many actions are added to it that it takes nine lines to include them all. Let's have a look at all the different details that are included. Remember the point of the initial long sentence is to explore the complexities of the speaker's thoughts and feelings about the snow, but also to create the sense that it fell for a long time. As we learn later, it fell all night. Flying, falling, and then settling and lying. These are the first few. What impression do we think these create? We've got flying and falling. Some people might argue that the repeated F sounds are onomatopoeic, creating the impression of snowflakes coming down quietly through the silent night air. But that might seem like quite a comforting or gentle image. Think of a Christmas card, for example, a quiet countryside and the snow coming down. But stealthily has got slightly different connotations. Yes, it means quiet, but stealth is normally needed when you don't want to get spotted. That sounds a bit to me more like a kind of military maneuver. You need to approach the enemy stealthily. So on the one hand, it seems like there's a comforting, very peaceful blanket of snow coming down, making the town beautiful. 
but on the other hand, stealthily makes it seem like a kind of attack or assault or invasion. So there's some nuance and subtlety in the way the snow is being portrayed at the beginning. Hushing as well, like a mother might hush a crying baby, for example, seems very gentle, comforting. But you combine that with deadening, muffling and stifling. These seem more unnerving, more ominous. So perhaps there's something menacing or awful about the snow. And you can see that also nothing can escape. It can get into angles and crevices. So its reach seems never ending. It also doesn't stop because we see that it falls all night. It transforms what it falls on, hiding difference, making unevenness even. Now, literally, this is about the blanket that covers the ground. But you could also argue an alternative reading, which is that the impact of the snow is a kind of equality, getting rid of differences between classes and ages in the poem. So for a brief moment, the adults at the end, for example, charmed by the snow, feel a little bit like the children who are enjoying it. Their minds aren't troubled by their daily cares and burdens. But we have to remember that even if we do argue this reading, the differences are merely hidden. It's temporary. Snow doesn't last forever. It melts quite quickly. So it's a brief momentary transformation. You'll notice that the rhyme scheme is alternate. So flying, lying, falling, railing, brown, town, down. Some people might argue that this rhyme scheme in general adds to the sense of a gentle but relentless snowfall. I think it's actually better if you can to avoid commenting on the rhyme scheme in general like that and better to focus on specific rhymes and we'll come to do that in more detail later after we've finished an overview of the poem. One example of a particular rhyme to focus on here at the beginning might be brown and town. So this might reinforce the association of the town in our minds with the image of it being dirty and grimy. We've said that flying and falling repeat the F sound, which is also in flakes. Here we get it again in floating. So it's important when you can to talk about sound effects. Flying, flakes, falling, floating. We also see that again with stealthily, silently, sifting, stifling, settling. So the soft repeated consonants along with some long vowels like road, roof and railing, again, perhaps create a gentle but relentless atmosphere suggesting the snowfall. The S sounds are repeated again with softly and sailing. And we've got the F in drifting, bringing us back to flying, falling, and floating, and failing here too. Remember, these are all coming within the first initial very long sentence. So the cumulative impact is very powerful. The first clause of the second sentence is just four words long. All night it fell. This means it's a significant contrast to the previous clause. The subordinate clause of the first sentence is when men were all asleep. But the second and main clause runs all the way from the snow came flying right the way down to the end of the sentence at drifting and sailing. So we move from what is essentially a nine line clause all the way from here to here immediately into just a very brief four word clause all night it fell. This means that this initial clause of the second sentence has a kind of summative tone to it. All night it fell essentially describes all the actions given for the snow in this long initial sentence. So this creates the atmosphere of the snow falling. And then this second sentence after it's fallen and now lies seven inches deep, this second sentence describes the impact of the snow on the town. The uncompacted lightness is a very interesting phrase. 
it makes the snow seem ethereal or otherworldly because for something to be seven inches deep on the ground would make us think of its weight. But here, because it's so fresh and no, and no one has trodden on it, it has a lightness to it, as if it could float away at any moment. Perhaps this also emphasises how fragile it is. The way the clouds blow off from a high and frosty heaven adds to this sense of it being ethereal or celestial. So the sky is cloudless, clear, and the coldness of the air mirrors the coldness of the snow on the ground. In Christianity, the number seven is symbolically important. The four corners of the earth combine with the Holy Trinity to make seven. So the fact that it rhymes with heaven is another example of a particular rhyme you could pick out to discuss its particular effect. We'll do this example later in more detail. Strange unheavenly glare is an important point to consider as well. It doesn't mean unheavenly as in from hell. Instead, what's happening is that normally the glare from the sunlight comes from the sky, from the heavens. But here what we've got is that the snow is so bright, which is why people are waking up to seeing the unaccustomed brightness. The snow is so bright that the floor, the snow, is glaring, not the sky. This is what makes it strange. Marveled suggests surprise, wonder, and astonishment. And the repetition of the word with the dash between it suggests how powerful the impression the snow is on the people waking up. St Thomas Aquinas said that sight is the most spiritual of the senses because it is the one that most ministers to reason. So sight is the first sense mentioned here. And it's not just my eye, but the eye, as if it represents a human response. It has a universal or general, rather than merely particular impact on the human mind. Dazzling suggests it's not merely surprising, but almost overwhelming or blinding. The triple rhyme between whiteness, brightness and lightness shows the cumulative impact of the snow. The words are also linked not only through sound, but also semantically, through their connotations of purity. The word strange is an important one to think about as well, because it means belonging to some other place, or unknown to the particular locality specified. So it doesn't seem to belong to the town, but more broadly speaking, it's as if it doesn't really seem to belong to this earth at all. It has a lightness to it that is heavenly. And we've said that seven is also religiously symbolic. So the snow seems like a miracle. Later on, it's called manna, meaning food from heaven. Hearkened here is a very old fashioned word. It's not really used nowadays in any other sense other than this poetic one. And it means to hear with attention or to listen to. So the idea here is that they are paying attention to, listening to the stillness. It's quite odd if you think about hearing stillness or silence. Because you've got no sounds and only a few busy morning cries. So what are they listening to in the stillness other than just quiet and silence? Well, hearkened can mean not only hearing with attention, but also having regard to or understanding. It's as if there's something to learn. So you could have a reading of hearkened as getting spiritual insight from. And I would argue the connotations of hearkened make it one of the most important words in the whole poem. The primary denotation of solemn is associated or connected with religious rites or observances. So there's a religious character or sacred character to the air here. Remember when you can to make links between different details. So solemn, for example, brings us back to hearkened, to marveled, to heaven, to seven, and the rhyme between seven and heaven. So what we're starting to do is make our selected details cohere into a personal response to the language of the poem. The first sentence then, 
from when to sailing describes the snowfall itself. The second from all night to spare establishes the impact of the snow on the atmosphere of the town. And in general, we've argued that it seems religious or sacred or spiritual. Now we come to a new point in the poem with sentence three. Then, boys, I heard. Remember, you don't get bullet points for the scene poems. You do for the unseen, but for the scene poems, it's best to think about where you can find some natural divisions within the poem itself. The best answers tend to follow the structure and development of the poems. So it seems that then here would be a good place to have what we would be thinking of as our second bullet point. It's the first time we hear the first person voice of the speaker of the poem, I heard. It's also the first time we have any characters in the poem speaking with direct speech. Oh, look at the trees. It's what the boys cry when they're excited. Normally, the syntax here would be subject, verb, object. So I heard boys. But here it's been inverted, putting boys at the beginning. This draws our attention to the boys as an interruption to the solemn stillness of the air previously. It also perhaps shows their energy and excitement. We can also see this through the verbs and participles they're given. Calling, gathered, tasting, snowballing, rioted, plunging, peering. This is a bit like what we had with the long initial sentences describing the snow. So one sentence from then to wonder, where we have one subject, they, the boys, but they're given lots of different verbs and participles. The shortest sentence in the whole poem, oh look at the trees, they cried, oh look at the trees, gains the power of understatement. It's dramatic because of its very short length. It's a kind of emotional climax in the poem because the boys can't contain their excitement and wonder as they look at what the snow has done to the trees. The verb cried reinforces this sense of an outburst, an intense emotion. Remember, it's good if you can to comment on the effect of particular sentence forms. Normally, in English, this would be a few carts creak and blunder with lessened load. But here, with lessened load is at the beginning of the sentence. This draws our attention to it, and it makes us think about the impact of the snow. So physically what's happening here is that the snow has meant that the carts can't carry as much because the going is difficult, it's slippery. But there's another point we could make. Not only their carts, but also their minds are less clogged or burdened. This is what no cares encumber their minds diverted means. So the snow has a kind of liberating effect on the carts, but also on their minds or souls. The image of Paul's high dome, so the dome of St Paul's Cathedral, is another example of a religious image in the poem, and we might link it to the high and frosty heaven. So high, for example, is repeated from here, here again, the high dome. This is literally its height as a building, but also thinking about the connotations of high as in heavenly. You might also make a connection between sparkling and brightness, dazzling and whiteness. It suggests the snow is resplendent in the morning sun. And this symbolizes ideas about its transcendence. Somber here means gloomy or dark, sullen or dejected. We're imagining their thoughts as being dismal or melancholy. And the fact that they're in trains makes us think about how they've lost their individual identity. There's also something mechanistic about the image of human beings as forming trains. There are so many that they're past tale. The fact that the men are anonymous means that they acquire a kind of universality. The poem is called London Snow, but the image presented could be of any city. Arguably, it's about the dehumanising impact of industrialisation. The fact that they're past tale of number 
gives it an almost mythic grandeur or significance too. It might even be an allusion to the same lines from Dante's Inferno that T.S. Eliot quotes in The Wasteland. So many, I had not thought death had undone so many. Unlike the boys though, they don't get many verbs or participles. Instead, they just tread and go. There's a lack of energy here, a lack of excitement. However, juxtaposed to this image of somberness is the fact that even for them, even for them, the snow has an effect and it frees them from their daily routine. The repetition of daily here in daily word and daily thoughts as well shows that they're very tied to their daily routine. But the sight of the beauty is such that even for them, they're partially freed from their normal everyday concerns and anxieties. So the snow has a transfiguring effect on the town and it makes them perceive the world in a new way. In this sense, there's something almost magical about it. It has a charm, it can bewitch them. Although it can't last for long, it's only for a while and eventually they break it. Candidates should practice exploring different possible interpretations, exploring alternative meaning. We've talked about this before, and it means that when you quote a detail, you need to give more than one reason why you think it's important. Ideally, give two or three. So let's look at stealthily. Stealthily denotes that the snow is settling overnight without being seen or heard. The first thing we need to do is show we know what the word means. Talk about the denotation. Go with the surface or basic meaning as your initial point. Then afterwards, dig a bit deeper and see if you can show off some more sensitivity in your reading. So I've used alternatively to introduce my additional point. This means that I'm using the language from the examiner's report and giving them what they want to see. Alternatively, however, it could connote that the snow is surreptitious, perhaps implying that it falls covertly or furtively. This evokes the sense that it has something to hide, making me think of a nighttime raid or attack on the town, an image developed later by the metaphor of war. So you can see here, I've got about six or seven points from one quotation. This is what the mark scheme means for top band by showing sensitivity, detail and insight. And I haven't done really much more than thought about what the word means and then what it might imply or suggest. If you can make links between details, like I've done at the end, with how the image of a stealthy attack is picked up by war being waged at the end of the poem, I think that's ideal. You won't always be able to do that, but when you can, what it's doing is basically joining up the dots for the examiner, joining up the dots of the poem so that you are showing what pattern you can see. Good essays join up more dots and make the pattern clearer, and you shouldn't be making the examiner do the work for you. So join up the dots, show what pattern you found. The more you can get into the habit of picking single words out for detailed comment, and then using verbs like denotes, connotes, and evokes to get you thinking about the effect of the single word you've quoted, the better. Manner is one of the most important words in the poem. So in the Bible, manna alludes to the substance miraculously provided each day as food for the Israelites in the wilderness after the departure from Egypt. That's something you just have to know, so learn that. That's why this is a seen poem rather than an unseen one. You've got all sorts of advantages to it being a seen poem if you're taking good notes. In Exodus 16, manna is described as being as fine as hoarfrost on the ground, which the uncompacted lightness of the snow recalls. So it's no coincidence that in the Bible, manna is like hoarfrost, and then in the poem, the snow is being compared to manna and has an uncompacted lightness. Once we've made that point about the allusion, so the indirect reference to Exodus, we can start to dig a bit deeper and think how it works in the poem. So now my second point comes in. It suggests that the snow is God-given spiritual nourishment that has been opportunely provided. We don't stop there, though, because we want more marks. So extra point. Alternatively, because in Christian use, manna frequently refers to the Eucharist, it might suggest 
that when the boys taste the snow, it is like a sacrament. This reinforces the reader's sense of the solemn or religious atmosphere. So it's just like we did with the previous word. Basic meaning, deeper meaning, extra deeper meaning, and then we're thinking, can we make a link to another detail? And what's the overall impact on the reader? So most people tend to do the opposite, and they'll quote lots of words, but not go into much detail. You get more marks for saying a lot about a little than you do for saying a little about a lot. Top of the mark scheme, we want insight, detail, sensitivity, personal engagement. So think carefully about the reasons you're giving for the quotations that you have chosen. It would be a good idea to give some alternative possible readings of the whole poem rather than just individual phrases as well. The main reason for doing this is not so you can sit on the fence between different readings. If you can mention a few possibilities and say which one you find most convincing and why, that's a way of you being able to advance your own reading of the poem. So let's have a look and make some notes on each of these ones then. So first way of looking at it, a savage attack on industrialization, published in 1880 in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution and captures the crushing monotony of lives in industrialised cities at the times. It highlights how people have become disconnected from nature and its beauty. Think about at the end of the poem, the sombre men, for example, meaning melancholy or dismal or gloomy. Their mood seems quite downbeat, downtrodden. So that's one way of looking at it. The city, in a way, has created a depressing atmosphere that's stultifying, ruining their lives. But another way to see it is that it is a celebration of the transformative power of nature, presents the snow as a gift from God using numerous religious references. It highlights nature's ability to lift the spirits of even the most downtrodden individual by concealing the ugliness of urban life. You could have both readings going together. You could have it being partly an attack on industrialization and partly a celebration of the transformative power of nature. So it's because life is so depressing and industrialized that nature has the potential to be transformative. So don't think you have to choose one and forget the others. Finally, we've got the idea that it highlights the tragic loss of innocence mankind experiences moving from childhood to adulthood. So the school children are very excited. They're very joyful. But it takes a little bit more work for the adults to respond to the beauty of the snow. And they wage war against it. There's some resistance there, but ultimately they can't totally resist it. So those are just some ideas that you could integrate into your answers. And remember, you get the best marks for weighing up the pros and cons of each. Right, moving on to the rhyme scheme. I think this is where people most often go wrong. And I'm actually going to use as examples for how not to talk about the rhyme scheme, some sentences from teachers who thought they were writing about it in a way that was gonna get full marks, but actually haven't done exactly what the examiner's looking for. So the instruction we get in the examiner's report is highlight the effect of individual rhymes, stresses or sentence forms and comment on their particular effect instead of generalising. So look at what they're looking for. Individual rhymes and then particular effects. Individual stresses, particular effects. Individual sentence forms, particular effects. So if you just say something like, the rhyme scheme makes me think of snow falling because it is repetitive but gentle. You might feel like you've made a good point because you talked about rhyme, but actually you haven't talked about particular rhymes. You've been too vague, too general. You can see why they're looking for individual details and particular effects when you have a look at the language used for full marks or top band in the mark scheme. So we must have well-selected references for everything we say. We also want to show individuality and insight. Now I bet you that there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of people saying that the rhyme scheme makes them feel that snow is falling down. So you can forget about being individual or showing much insight if you just make a waffly point about the rhyme scheme like that. We also want sensitivity and considerable detail, so we need to explain as we had before, 
a lot, about a little. You're much better off thinking about which is your favourite rhyme or which particular sentence do you think is most effective rather than saying some are long, some are short and the variation makes me think of the snow coming and going in bursts. Think about particular details. And then we want to try and keep it going all the way through. If you just have one point about the rhyme scheme, say it makes you think of snowfall, it's quite hard to sustain that. And it's also quite hard to really evaluate that point. It's too simplistic. So here we have some examples of comments on the rhyme scheme that I don't think are very good. And they're actually written by people who thought they were giving perfect examples of how to write about rhyme. But if you think about it for a second, you'll see what is missing. So the first one, Bridges' use of the rhyme scheme gives the reader the impression that the snow is gently and incessantly falling, acting as a positive force on London which cannot be stopped. I think that does have some merit to it. The rhyme scheme does relate to the snow, but talking about the rhyme scheme overall hasn't got to the level of individual particular details yet. This one here, the fixed rhyme scheme reinforces the view that the city remains the same beneath its white covering. So we're starting to think about how the rhyme scheme might be linked to the themes of the poem, how the rhyme scheme is relevant to what's being described. So at least we're trying to talk about the effect, but it's just the rhyme scheme overall. Most rhymes are feminine, which recreates the gentle snowfall. So this is getting a little bit better now because we're starting to get down to some rhymes rather than just the rhyme scheme in general. Feminine rhyme is when you end, when you rhyme, on an unstressed, so weaker syllable. Some people find the term feminine rhyme offensive because it comes from the fact that women generally are weaker than men. I don't think it's worth getting offended about silly things like that. If you want to take action and talk about offensive things, you'd be better off focusing on things like female genital mutilation in different countries rather than just rhyme schemes. That's offensive. Using a term like feminine rhyme is not offensive. The poem is a single stanza, which might capture the relentless snowfall. One stanza long means we've got a relentless snowfall. Yes, in a way, but still, there's probably better ways of talking about that because you quoted the whole poem, saying the whole thing is one stanza. You might be better off looking at how the first two sentences are the longest, then it's more specific, more individual, more particular. The lack of stanza breaks conveys that the event happens quickly and before long, the snow has disappeared. Note that this falls into the same trap as the previous one. Essentially, these two last comments are quoting the entire poem, quoting the entire poem and saying one thing about it. So we haven't got as much insight as we could have. So what are examples of some good comments? Here is a way to talk about an individual rhyme that I think would get you full marks. So we picked out one rhyme in particular to focus on, the rhyme between seven and heaven. And let's think what ideas we've got about it. The rhyme between seven and heaven is particularly effective because it emphasises the spiritual significance of the transfigured town. Just find seven and heaven in the poem and annotate the notes here on your copy so you can see the process you should be going through as you are planning the answer. So first thing is, get a verb given the effect. Emphasises the spiritual significance. Now we want to try and say why it does this. So it associates the snow not only with the divine because of heaven, but also with the broader semantic field. So we're making links to elsewhere in the poem of religious diction such as marveled, wonder and manner. So seven and heaven go together and then heaven also goes with marveled, wonder and manner. Remember, don't read quotations in isolation. You've got to think about the context of each quotation being the rest of the poem. So what does it reinforce? There's a, so Coleridge, the English poet who wrote The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner that you might know about, he said that really good works of literature are like spider's webs. So you touch one strand of it and the rest of them vibrate. So we're thinking now about the connections between the different parts of the web. Once we've done that though, we can't just sit back and think that we've said enough. Try to bring in an extra point. Alternatively, given the religious symbolism of the number seven, 
e.g. in the New Testament, it represents the unity of the four corners of the earth with the Holy Trinity, 4 plus 3, 7. It could be argued that the rhyme highlights not just the similar sound, but also the sense of the words. So the number 7, there's something divine about that too. So we're thinking about this one rhyme helping to establish the religious mood or atmosphere that the snow has created, magically transforming the everyday lives of the people waking up to see it. Let's have a look at an individual metrical stress as well. If you have a look at all the lines right at the beginning from stealthily right down to all night. So look at the beginning of each line from stealthily down to all night. Every word in the English language has got one stress syllable. And you can even find it if you look it up in a dictionary. And that includes big words like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Yep. If you, put the fr if you put the stress in the wrong place, you're mispronouncing it. If we look at the first syllable of each of these lines, what you'll spot is that it's stressed. At the beginning of those lines from stealthily to all night, what you should do is put a forward slash like this. I'll draw one on here for you. You need to put a forward slash over the stressed syllable like this. So stealthily, that stressed syllable on stealth, then illy is weak. So just note that you can put a forward slash like that on stealthily and then on all night. Each of the initial syllables is stressed. So we need to think about what the impact of that is. I would argue that it's effective because it means that each line starts with a kind of pulse of energy and it makes us remember how the snow is perpetual, incessant. It seems to be falling non-stop. Then afterwards, once the snow has finished falling, none of the following six lines begins with a stress. And that's when the mood, the atmosphere becomes still, becomes quiet. So the sound of the syllables, the sound of the words, changes according to what's going on. When the snow is falling and is relentless, perpetual, incessant and powerful, there's lots coming down, we start with stresses, it seems energetic. Then once it's over, the lines begin in a very quiet way because it's about stillness, silence and solemnity. So that's one point we could make about it. We've also got a contrast in there. And then we've said, alternatively, the contrast might further emphasise the power of the snow by showing how stifled and muffled the town is now. So it's important, whenever you can, to show off more of your insight into the poem by giving more than one point. So we've gone from individual stresses. Then we've made a link to a place where we don't get initial stresses at the beginning of the line talking about the impact of the contrast, then we've given an extra reading as well. So if we compare these comments to the ones we started with, we can see here we've got far more detail. This poem is quite an easy one to get marks for talking about sentence forms with. I wouldn't want people just to say that we start with two long sentences and then in general get some shorter ones and finish with some longer ones. You can do better than that. So one of the best things to comment on is, then boys I heard. You would expect it to be, then I heard boys. So normally in English we have subject, then verb, then object. Here though, we need to get the fact that it's been inverted. So everyone find the clause, then boys I heard in the poem. And annotate it as being inverted syntax, inverts. I-N-V-E-R-T-E-D, inverted syntax. So what does this show? Good. So it's an emphatic device, but we don't get any marks for just saying the inverted syntax adds emphasis. That's a really common mistake. People spot a technique and just say it adds emphasis. Or even worse, they say it gives me a picture in my head or it makes me want to read on. The only thing I think of when you write gives me a picture in my head is you when you get your exam result back. I get a picture of you not getting the grade you want. That is the picture it draws for me when you write about pictures in your head. So you've got to be precise. What we can say then is something more like this. Relate it to the tone of the speaker. So the voice saying that, the I here, 
This is the first time in the poem that we actually get the first person used, I. It's the first time it happens. And this unusual word order, then boys I heard, tells us something about the speaker's attitude. So I would note down something like, seems surprised, then boys I heard, but also joyful. And it also reflects the idea that the boys there playing in the snow are very energetic and excited. So they burst onto the previously quiet scene. Remember, it's very still, it's solemn. There's not much noise around, not many people going to work. So the sense of disruption is captured in the unusual word order of the sentence. So this is much better than saying that a particular sentence is long. Or even worse, that the sentences just change length. I do think you should comment on the fact that we start with two nine-line sentences, though. That is important. They're the two longest ones. And they describe the snow falling and then its impact. So you might suggest that this creates a sense of the relentlessness of the snowfall. It goes on for a long time, nine lines, lots of different verbs and participles. <coughs> and then the second sentence about its impact shows that nothing really escapes. It's very far reaching. It has a deep, profound impact. So we've noted that there are two long sentences. And then we've said what we think the effect of it is. So particular detail, particular effect. That's how you get the marks. Last thing to note, it's a good idea, remember, longest sentence and shortest sentence, whatever poem you've got. As a minimum, comment on those. You won't always find inverted syntax, but when you do, it's worth thinking about. The shortest sentence and the only direct speech in the whole poem is when the boys cry out, oh, look at the trees. I think this is a kind of emotional climax in the poem, and it's made even more powerful because the same phrase is repeated twice. It's also an exclamation. And the verb for it, cried, shows a kind of intensity to it as well. So very short sentence, makes it very dramatic, makes it stand out. And that effect is reinforced by the repetition, by the exclamation mark, and by the verb used as well. So those are all examples of details you could use to talk about particular sentences and why they matter. Can everyone see the difference between these and those ones we started off with? Yeah, so small details, lots of reasons. It's quite a long poem and it's all one stanza. So it can be quite a tough one to get your head around for thinking about how to structure your essay. Let's just have a quick refresher on what the skeleton, the structure of the essay should look like. Let's say you get a question about how the writer conveys thoughts and feelings. First thing to do is make sure that we've got that phrase from the question in every single paragraph. So you can see in yellow, I'm keeping it going throughout the whole answer. So that's step one, answer the question. Then I want to pick out what for an unseen poem would be my three topics for my bullet points. I don't get bullet points for the scene poetry, I just have to know them. So if you don't know three things to say about each of your scene poems, one for the beginning, one for the middle, one for the end, it's gonna to be tough for you in the exam when you have to think of what your paragraphs are gonna be on. So I've just gone for, roughly speaking, it seems to overwhelm the town, the atmosphere it creates is spiritual, and then even the adults are freed from their daily routine at the end. So paragraph one, two, and three. In boxes in my topic sentences, I've made sure to mention those ideas I introduced in my introduction. And I've made each topic sentence linked to the previous one. I should have put a box around overwhelms here. Then you could have seen more clearly that overwhelms picks up on my first topic sentence there. I've remembered to do it here. So spiritual atmosphere links back to my second topic sentence. And then I introduced my last point in my third paragraph. Note also the way I've linked my topics. Initially, developing, and then finally. So I follow the way the poem builds line by line. My conclusion isn't just saying, so overall we can see that he shows his thoughts in various ways, including imagery, metaphor, word choices. Someone writing that sort of topic sentence just needs to be given a cup of cocoa, go and have a nap, go to bed. They've forgotten how to write essays. Wake up the next day, try again. Instead, you're much better off to have, much better off to have a particular quotation to give you the chance of hitting some more points on the mark scheme. Quotations are a bit like ammo that give you something to actually fire at the mark scheme. If you haven't got one, you probably won't get a point. 
So at the end then, how the ear hearkened. To hearken means to listen, but also to understand or respond to. So the silence seems to have some sort of message for the listener. And the moral message for mankind about the beauty of nature, I think will be a good point to finish on, bearing in mind that beauty is in the last line of the poem as well.